Good morning. It is Thursday, the day that we have set aside to open God's Word together for a Bible study. It is great to be with you. I pray that you have had a great week thus far. I pray that you and your families are doing well. I pray that you are being safe and only going out when you have to, wearing your mask and gloves and staying more than six feet away from those who don't live in the household with us. Um, we're thanking God that he is uh, keeping us through this and that we will get through this together. Um, and we want to make sure we do our part in being, in being safe. Uh, again, it's great to be with you. Let's uh, pray together before we get started. Um, we have quite a bit to cover. I want to make sure we uh, maximize our time together. Let's pray. Gracious God, we thank you for this opportunity to talk with you, to hear from you together. We ask for your presence to be with us. Help us to understand your word and your will more clearly as we hear what your word says, how the law that we find in the Hebrew Bible was significant in Jesus' life and therefore its significance in our lives. Let your word go forth. Go f let your word do what you want it to do. Glorify yourself and edify your people. It's in your son Jesus' name I pray. Amen. All righty. Today is session three of Re-Encountering Jesus. We've done an introductory session. We also took two weeks to discuss, uh, with two hours uh, over the last two weeks, to discuss Jesus' roots. Just as we get to know any other person, uh, we looked at Jesus' background, we looked at Jesus' family, we looked at the culture in which Jesus lived, and we'll continue that discussion in some way today as well as in every session. However, we did want to lay that groundwork um, to the previous two sessions with uh, two hours, I should say, and one session that we split up over two hours uh, with Jesus' roots. And we did an introductory session trying to um, come to an understanding of why it's important to understand who Jesus is based on the Bible. And as you see with the picture that we have for our series, there are many different images of Christ uh, in the world. Some are... Uh, related to information we have in scripture. Some are completely away from it, um, but most, if not all of them, uh, that we looked at and discussed are based upon where we are in wanting a image of Jesus that is comfortable for us, an image that we like, um, image, image that fits what we want it to be. And we talked about the dangers of doing that and the uh, challenges of doing that and how we want to, uh, as Christians, those of us who are Christians, we want to have the picture of Jesus based upon the Bible. Uh, it may be, it may line up with what we've been taught. It may not. Um, but we want to have the picture of Jesus in Scripture so that we can have an accurate understanding of who our Lord and Savior was when he walked the earth because that has some bearing on how we live out our faith. Uh, we also, for those who may not be Christians, we want um, you to, as you are, if you are considering joining us on this journey, and we pray that you are, uh, to have the image of Jesus of Scripture because we know how some of the images that are out there and some of the ways that uh, Christians communicate the Bible and Christians have lived out the Bible has not been life-giving, it has not been edifying, it has not been building up. So we want to present the image of Christ in Scripture and direct people to God uh, so that a relationship can be built. I've said this before and I'll continue saying it, Christianity is not a religion, it is about a relationship with God through His Son Jesus Christ and Jesus Christ's finished work. 
if we have a relationship with God, uh, as we'll see uh, somewhat clearly in today's session, then we will have everything else line up correctly. It's about having a relationship with God through Jesus based on the finished work of Christ um, so that we can then have the life that God wants us to have, live the way God wants us to live, to love God and to love all people as God loves all people. So again, today is session three. It's about the law. We want to discuss and, and discern the significance of the law when Jesus was living on earth. Uh, the law that we have in the Hebrew Bible, uh, we traditionally call it the Old Testament. Uh, want to shift us to call it the Hebrew Bible, and I'll explain why in a moment, and how what is there Jesus said he came to fulfill the law and the prophets. And we'll talk about the prophets next week. And since he came to fulfill it, that means it has some significance and applic applicability to our lives. And it definitely has significance. And Jesus lived in accordance with it when he was walking on earth. I mean, we know Jesus never sinned. However, we also see these confrontations and discussions and even controversies, we could say, uh, that Jesus had with some of the other people he shared his time on earth with. So it begs the question, if Jesus never sinned, but these other people said he was breaking the law, why did they say that? Well, if you notice in those situations, Jesus says something to the effect of, you have heard said, but I say. The reason he did that is there was a spirit of the law that at times was not being followed. There is a law that we have, and if you would like an outline, and I strongly encourage you to download it, uh, you'll see at the very beginning that there were 613 separate laws in the five books of Torah. Those are the first five books that we have in our Bible, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers. And Deuteronomy. There are 248 commands, 265 prohibitions. The 248 commands is essentially those are telling us what to do. Prohibitions are telling us what not to do. And then the Pharisees that Jesus kept coming in contact with, they made up over time 1,521 amendments to those laws. Now, uh, as one, one thing that we just need to say out the gate, one of the reasons Jesus had to come to be born for us, to live for us, to die for us, to be raised from the grave for us, and to ascend back to heaven was because no human can keep all of those laws. As we hear those numbers, we can just, we can just be honest. That sounds like a ridiculous amount of laws to try to live by uh, knowing that we are human. However, they're there, so there is significance as we'll get to. Uh, just as we continue our overview, the Ten Commandments, those may be the most familiar group and set of uh, laws or commandments that we have. And some of those would even could even be classified as prohibitions, but uh, we traditionally call them the Ten Commandments. Uh, the word that is used in biblical scholarship is the Decalogue, uh, using the Greek and Hebrew words uh, that refer to the number ten. Um, and, and we'll get into that in a moment, but the Ten Commandments, those are found in Exodus chapter 20, verses 2 through 17. They're also found in Deuteronomy chapter 5, verses 6 through 21. Uh, those are the only sets of laws that are explicitly duplicated. Uh, the reason they were duplicated is the context of each of the books. Exodus was written during the people, or it occurred, I should say, um, when the people were in the wilderness after God had delivered them from Egyptian slavery, they were on their way to the promised land. The book of Deuteronomy, however, uh, was written at a much later time. It was actually written during the time that we have in our Bible of some of the kings and the monarchy and the, the Israelites had experienced several different episodes of uh, prosperity and then exile and back and forth. And they rewrote, they wrote Deuteronomy to remind the people of an oral tradition, stories that had been passed down through generations 
of Moses' last instructions to the people before he died and the people were going to go into the promised land. So it was a reminder of what God had done and said through Moses, and they wanted to remind some of the people about what we have as the Ten Commandments. So that's one of the reasons that it's duplicated. Another reason, uh, just going to a, a, a practical level and in some ways a spiritual level, we have to be reminded of what God has told us to do. And sometimes we'll be reminded of what God has told us not to do. And so there's that, that level of repetition, and we know uh, the repetition is said to be uh, the parent of learning. Then we have the book of the covenant. That's Exodus chapter 20, verse 22 to, through Exodus 23 and 33. And that is what immediately follows uh, the Ten Commandments being given. And there's this uh, explanation of a relationship. God did this for the people, and so now God expects this as they have this relationship um, as well. And again, we have to emphasize the, that, that is a relationship and not a religion. Uh, then we have the book of Leviticus. Uh, it's 26 chapters in Leviticus. Much of it, if not all of it, is about is laws and all of that. The first half is about sacrifice and feast days. Uh, that is, there was a particular way that the people of Israel showed their relationship and love to God by what they ate um, and how they gave these sacrifices uh, that they had discerned that they needed to give um, in relation to their sins. And even in those sacrifices, and we touched on this a little bit with Jesus' roots, there were different animals that could be purchased based upon um, the financial situation of each family. So some families only could afford to purchase birds, so they were able to do that so that everyone could participate in the worship of the Lord. Uh, and I'm sure you can glean uh, the significance of that, even in that time, uh, that people were allowed to worship God based upon where they are, not based upon where people thought they should be. Okay. Um, the second part of uh, and the feast days were important, too. We've talked about that somewhat as well. There were times set aside that there were particular moments in their calendar for them to worship God for the different acts that God had revealed God's self in their community. That's just like for us, for example, a birthday. We're grateful that God blessed us to be born into this world and then that we live the number of years that God blessed us to do it so that we celebrate birthday. We tell people happy birthday. We call them and tell them happy birthday. Uh, so that they can feel the appreciation of the impact they've had on our lives. And in our lives, they feel appreciated, and we celebrate how God has blessed them with another year. It's a similar type of thing. That's a month, somewhat of a celebrating a person, but then there are communal days. That's why we celebrate anniversaries, celebrate wedding anniversaries. We celebrate church anniversaries that God's hand is on a particular church, and it's done it for a number of years. Uh, we celebrate other anniversaries. Uh, now, when we celebrate those just as they did with these feast days, we don't pretend that everything about some of those uh, anniversaries, holiday celebration um, are without flaw. And so there may be times of critique uh, that we do some evaluation that is this a celebration of something positive? Is it a celebration we need to give some thought to and reconfigure? And that even happened in the Bible. That even happened in, in these times. The second half of Leviticus is what is called the holiness code. Uh, here is where we know this passage, or we've heard, potentially heard this passage. Is God says that God is holy, so we should be holy. Uh, that is, we cannot be God. We cannot be pure like God. However, we can strive to be godly. And, and even in the law, there were... Um, practices in place so that they could, when they came to worship, that they could come to worship uh, in such a way that there was some purity involved. Uh, not necessarily purity as we traditionally learned it, but purity in the sense, I want to bring my best self to God in worship. Now, we have to back up and remember worship, biblically defined, is about a lifestyle, not just an event that we participate in on Sunday morning. Uh, so we should not just try to be 
uh, presenting our best selves to God based upon who God is, our relationship with God and God's expectation. We should not wait to do that and we're getting prepared for worship on Sunday on Saturday. And we should prepare on Saturday for worship on Sunday. However, we should be seeking to live a life that is pleasing in God's sight. And so that's what this holiness code uh, in summation really was about. The book of Numbers is largely um, laws as well. Uh, we have to know the context of Numbers as well. These are people on the move. Again, when we look at Exodus, they were in the wilderness. They were on their way to the promised land. Uh, the book of Deuteronomy was written again uh, centuries later, reflecting back, putting um, in writing the last speech of Moses that had been passed down for generations as an oral story. And many of us have those stories that our families tell us, our parents or grandparents, aunts and uncles have told us it was a similar type of uh, practice. It was oral before it was written. And then the book of Numbers was similar. But these people were on the move. And as they moved, there were different situations that presented themselves. And as best they could, they discerned what God was saying about some of these situations, and there were changes made to the rules. Now, I wanted to make sure we point that out because some of these laws were human-made laws, and then they tried to slap God on top of them and say that it was of God as opposed to discerning first and then putting some things. So when we look and read, if we read through these books, we'll notice laws being changed. We'll notice clarifications being given. And as we'll get to at the end of today's session, Jesus himself still had to make some clarification about some of these laws because they were human made, not of God. There were other laws that were of God, but the ways they were being practiced and put into place and uh, even legislated uh, were not lining up with with God's nature. And so an example of that is in Numbers chapter 27, verse 1 through 11. Again, you'll see on the handout. Uh, the book of Numbers, the majority of the book, I shouldn't say the majority of it, but a, a good chunk of the book is about law. Numbers 1 through 10, chapters 1 through 10, as well as chapters 27 through 30. In chapter 27, there were these daughters of a gentleman named uh, Zelophehad. He died, and in that culture, at the time, only the sons were entitled to inheritance. But he did not have any sons, he only had daughters. And so the daughters go to Moses and they say, why is it that you all are practicing sexism? I'm paraphrasing, but why is it you all are practicing sexism? My dad owned this land. He died. Why is it that only if he had sons, it could be passed on to daughters? And then in verse number five, it says, Moses brought their case to the Lord. And the Lord spoke to Moses saying, the daughters of Zelophehad are right in what they are saying. You shall indeed let them possess an inheritance amongst their father's brothers and pass the inheritance of their father on to them. And then it goes on and they, the law is clarified and made the way God intends for it to be made so that men and women were treated equally when it came to that inheritance. Now, we know from some stories in the New Testament, some of the parables Jesus told, it didn't always get practiced that way. And again, we have to realize that some portions of the Bible are there so that we can learn what not to do. We can learn from uh, ways that people drop the ball and so that we can have the opportunity to get it right. Just as God gave them the opportunity to get it right in many of those passages. And so I wanted to point that out, even that even in the Old Testament, God sought for there to be equality among men and women. Then we get to Deuteronomy 1 through 30. Most of that book is law from that, that last message that Moses gave, the last sermon that Moses preached. And the Deuteronomic Code is Deuteronomy chapter 12 through 26. Now, I'll go ahead and say this now as well. Um, some of us grew up and there were people who told us and taught and some, some even preached that because of the New Testament, we didn't need the Old Testament. Okay, that, that, is, that is an example of why I want to shift us to calling the Old Testament the Hebrew Bible. Because we hear old, and sometimes old can have a negative connotation for some reason. It should not, 
because even if God blesses us to get old, it's a blessing. And we see that in Proverbs where gray hair is called a crown. OK. However, we hear new and old. And sometimes we we get those words in our mind because of our culture and it becomes a comparison or we put one here and one there or vice versa. When, in fact, the entire Bible has been put together for you and me. And so um, some of us have been taught because of the new covenant that the old covenant uh, didn't matter and all of that. And that's not that's not good Bible. That's not good uh, biblical theology. That's not a good understanding of the nature of God and what Jesus came to do and what we can read for ourselves that Jesus says. Uh, the entire Bible is for us. And so, again, Jesus said he came to fulfill the law, not abolish it. And so uh, when we consider that, that helps us see that there is continuity in the whole Bible uh, from beginning to end. OK, um, here is the first statement of summation. And it's it, it's we're going to continue with some of these pieces in the Old Testament. Um, but but here is a statement of summation. And I'll read it a couple of times because it is lengthy. And again, I do encourage you to download the handout, uh, given the the information that we're going through uh, in this series. Here it is. The law promotes and legislates social justice as well as economic parity. They are particularly concerned with the rights of the most vulnerable members of society, widows, orphans, strangers, which we could translate to immigrants and the poor in general. These constitute the foundational laws of justice that govern Judaism and Jewish life in Jesus' time. Their insistence on justice was formative and foundational to the ethics, morality, worldview, and social consciousness upon which the ministry of Jesus was based. i read that again. The law promotes and legislates social justice as well as economic parity. They are particularly concerned with the rights of the most vulnerable members of society, widows, orphans, immigrants, and the poor in general. These constitute the foundational laws of justice that govern Judaism and Jewish life in Jesus' time. Their insistence on justice was formative and foundational to the ethics, morality, worldview, and social consciousness upon which the ministry of Jesus was based. Okay. God has always been concerned about not just our spiritual salvation, but our holistic salvation. He cares about everything about us, every area of our life. He wants us to submit every area of our life to him, live for him and for other people. Here are some examples. If you, you'll see here on the handout, it says under the heading, including the forbidding, the charging of interest to poor borrowers. That's in Exodus chapter 22 and 25. Protecting the poor from exploitation by providing transparent business practices. That's in Leviticus chapter 19, verses 35 through 36, as well as Deuteronomy chapter 25, 13 to 15. Safeguarding the dignity of debtors by forbidding creditors from confronting them at their homes. Deuteronomy chapter 24, verses 10 through 11. I wish bill collectors knew that now. Uh, I wish some of these telemarketers knew that verse and passage of scripture right now. Maybe our phone will be ringing like they do sometimes. Protecting employees by requiring that wages be paid on the day they are earned. That's Deuteronomy chapter 24, verses 14 and 15. Specifically forbidding perversions of justice against the poor. Exodus chapter 23 and 6. Prohibiting partiality and bribes in the courts. Because such actions inevitably benefited the rich. Even during B the Bible days, there were people in the criminal justice system being bribed so that some people would get favorable treatment and other people, in particular, the rich would get favorable treatment and the poor would get unfavorable treatment. That's in Deuteronomy chapter 1, verse 17 and Leviticus chapter 19, verse 15. Enhancing justice in the courts by increasing both the requirements for valid testimonial witnesses and the penalty for false testimony. That's Deuteronomy chapter 19, verses 15 to 21. Establishing the year of Jubilee, which is the end of a 50-year cycle, 
At the end of that 50 year cycle, all lands were to be returned to the families of their original owners and all bond servants released. That's Leviticus chapter 25 and 10. The point of establishing a year of Jubilee was such that everyone would have an opportunity. Every family would have an opportunity for uh, having their own land to live on and live off of in terms of the farming if they needed to uh, sell those crops so that they would have what they needed to live. That's what the year of Jubilee was in place for. So again, we hear even in the Old Testament, God's concern and God's desire that every family uh, have financial stability. Uh, not necessarily be rich, but have financial stability and have what they need so all of their needs would be provided for. Uh, they made sacred economic parity by allowing the poor to bring less expensive sacrifices to the temple. That's in Leviticus chapter 12 and 14. And we discussed that earlier that everyone, no matter what their financial status, would have an option and options so that they could come and worship God and give their best to God and not be concerned. Well, I don't have this and they do have this. So only they can worship God. No, God intended that everyone have the opportunity uh, to come and experience uh, uh, worship services even at that time. We have, to, we have to start there because all of this comes to bear on who Jesus was. Jesus lived in accordance uh, with all of the information we just said and more. That was just an overview of some of what is included in the law. And as we hear, those are examples that Jesus talked about in his parables and in his responses to the Pharisees and Sadducees and other people in his culture and that he pressed them because they were not treating everyone equal and everyone should have been treated equally, not based on zip codes. We talked about that with his heritage and how the city folk and the country folk were clashing and how that was not of God. Then we talked about the economic exploitation going on even during Jesus' time. Here we have laws that they should have been following that they knew of and they were not following. And while they were adding all these 1500 amendments, they weren't following the ones uh, that were in the spirit of God. Now, to that end, here is why uh, I have encouraged you all before. I will continue to encourage you and anyone who asks me to read the Bible, starting with the Gospel of John, then Matthew, Mark and Luke, then read the rest of the New Testament. Then go back and read the Old Testament. When we read what is in the New Testament, what Jesus said of himself. That's also why we, before we started this series, uh, we had the sermon series of the I Am statements to hear who Jesus says Jesus is. Not who somebody else says Jesus is, not who we've heard Jesus is and all of that, but who Jesus is from Jesus' own lips and how God wanted to reveal that to us in this day and time for such a time as this, so that we can get into um, as best we can discern while God is, is doing his, his work in 2020, uh, that we can understand uh, the Jesus of Scripture, see the Jesus of Scripture, hear the Jesus of Scripture, and put it into application. If we read the Bible in that fashion, in that order, we get this clarification that Jesus gave. Uh, the best, I think, w place to look at this clarification begins in Matthew chapter 22. Uh, I am going to read uh, that passage. Um, it, it's, it's a familiar passage even for um, those of us who may not be Christian um, because this is where we get, um, in some sense, uh, the golden rules. Matthew chapter 22, verses 34 through 40. When the Pharisees heard that he had silenced the Sadducees, they gathered together and one of them, a lawyer, asked him a question to test him. Teacher, which commandment in the law is the greatest? Jesus said to him, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul and with all your mind. This is the greatest and first commandment. And the second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. On these two commandments hang all the law and the prophets. Now, this gives a clarification because um, before uh, the way that it was said, it was in the negative in terms of don't treat someone the way you don't want to be treated. 
But Jesus said it was God and always has been God's intent for the for the law to be. You should love your neighbor as yourself. That's different. That is not only don't do this to them, but if you would do it for yourself, do it for other people. If you don't want an exorbitant amount of interest to be charged when you need to borrow some money, don't do it to somebody else. If you wouldn't eat it, you might not need to offer it to somebody else. If you wouldn't wear it, you might not need to buy that for somebody else unless they specifically ask for it. And you know that's their specific taste. Um, if you know you would rather be given something as opposed to sold something, then you give it away and trust me to take care of you and your family. Uh, if, if, if you know you need help, and you might not necessarily have the money to pay for the help, but you have the help, then when you offer help to other people, don't charge them financially for the help. Just be a blessing to somebody because you're available and you can and you've discerned that I want to help you with it. And, and, and as, as always, this starts with the family and then branches out to the community and the neighborhood and the country and the world. We live in a day and time and in a culture where we think we should get paid for everything. We live in a day and time and in a culture where we think we have to be financially compensated for everything that we do. How many times was Jesus financially compensated for what he did? I think we all know the answer to that question. But then again, those of us who are followers of his at times, uh, we Americanize Jesus as opposed to taking Jesus as he is in Holy Scripture, understanding the culture and times in which he lived and then applying it to our lives because Christianity in and of itself, being a follower of Jesus in and of itself is countercultural in every sense. Jesus created issues in his day and time. And we if we're following him, there will be times where being a Christian means that we rattle the cages, that we make situations uncomfortable and that is the only way that change is going to happen so that God's will is done on earth as it is in heaven because heaven standards the kingdom of heaven standards rarely line up with the standards of what, because we are first and foremost residents of heaven and being residents of heaven means that we're going to come in conflict with where we live now if we're living according to heaven's principles and so that that happens so Jesus was actually quoting, in case you wanted to know where he got those two uh, laws that he was clarifying, uh, the first one was in Deuteronomy chapter 6, verse 5. The second one was in Leviticus 19, verse 18, and that is there on your handout. Another area that we get uh, clarification is in the Sermon on the Mount. Um, it is found in two places. It's found in Matthew and it's found in Luke. Um, in Matthew, which chapter five through seven uh, is also in Luke. And the first area we look at uh, is the Beatitudes. And I do want to read those. The Beatitudes are found in Matthew five, verse three through eleven. Luke chapter six, verses 20 through 26. Um, and that is there on your handout as well. But here is what the Beatitudes say. When Jesus saw the crowds, he went up to the mountain and after he sat down, his disciples came to him. Then he began to speak and taught them, saying, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, for they will be comforted. That is, can be applied to mourning in terms of a loved one transitioning from labor to reward. But that is also who mourn at the culture. That is also who mourn at the sin that is prevalent um, in the world because God mourns about that. And those of us who are followers of Jesus Christ, we should not be comfortable nor excited when it comes to sin on a personal nor a communal level. In a, in a personal, private or public sin, a societal sin, communal sin, we should mourn that. Blessed are the meek for they will inherit the earth. Uh, meek does not mean uh, that we're soft. Meek does not mean uh, that we are passive. A meek does mean that we have humility in knowing who we are, but it is a confident humility uh, that we have pride in ourselves, but we're not full of pride. We know who we are. We know whose we are. 
which includes understanding we're not better than anybody, but at the same time, we are God's son, we're God's daughter, and so we can live with some confidence, but not arrogance, okay? Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they will be filled. We talked about that righteousness um, in Jesus' culture and righteousness and justice are interchangeable. It is not just about how I can live so that I don't sin in my personal life. It is how do I live such that God's justice is served so that everyone on the planet is treated as God loves them. Everyone on the planet has access to everything that they need uh, because they are human and God loves everybody on the planet that has lived, that is living, and that will live. And it says that we will be filled. That is, if we live for God, if we give ourselves and the resources God gives to us and we, we utilize ourselves and our resources for God's purposes, God promises to take care of us. That's what that means in verse 6. Verse 7, blessed are the merciful for they shall receive mercy. Mercy is, we, is, is from God. Mercy is we don't experience all the consequences of the sins that we commit. We should treat other people with mercy. Just because someone does you wrong doesn't mean you, we should get vengeance. Vengeance is mine, says the Lord. That's in scripture as well. Um, sometimes we have to forgive, not so that the other person feels okay, but so that we're not holding on to any negativity in, our, in ourselves so that we can have good mental health, that we can have good physical health. Studies have shown that when we hold grudges, that's another word for not giving mercy. If we hold on to grudges, uh, it can cause all kinds of health issues. You know, do, do a search on your favorite search engine and you can find that some, what some of that stuff says. And that's in a practical sense. There's also mental health issues that come with holding on to a grudge. And then there are spiritual ramifications because we can see somebody come in church uh, or we can even see somebody out in public. We can see somebody's Facebook profile come up. And because we mad at them for something they did years ago, that can mess up the rest of our day. And they going on and they happy, joyful, what have you. And we got an attitude and we upset about something. And so I'm not saying and neither is it biblical to say that forgiveness means that we forget. That's not in the Bible. However, forgiveness is letting go of all of that negativity so that that person doesn't have any control over our lives, mentally, physically, otherwise. We're not dealing with the negative consequences that come from holding on to stuff. Forgiveness also does not mean we go back into the relationship that we had with them prior to the offense being committed. That is something that we have to discern on our own with God. There will be times that someone offends us, sins against us, and forgiveness will mean at some, at some level and at some time the repair of the relationship. At other times, it will not. And again, that is what we have to discern uh, from God. Uh, but God always says forgive, but the application of forgiveness uh, can vary depending upon the circumstance and the situation. And we have to discern that on our own. And even to some degree, we have to be OK with other people not understanding why we forgave who we forgave, um, particularly if they're not Christian. But if they're Christian, they should understand that we forgave the person because we we're commanded to forgive. We're told to forgive so that we will be forgiven. And since we're forgiven by God for our sins, we should forgive other people for sinning against us. However, uh, the what forgiveness looks like can vary. Again, sometimes it will mean the repair of the relationship. Sometimes it won't. Sometimes it will mean a partial repair. And that is what we have to discern on our own with God and also be comfortable knowing that other people may not understand why we forgave the person and how their forgiveness is played out. Some people are not going to understand why we allow the repairing of the relationship. Other people are going to say, well, if you forgave them, then why aren't you hanging out with them anymore? Because forgiveness does not always mean that. We have to discern based upon the offense, based upon the relationship, based upon the frequency of the offense. And that's going to be between us and God, what that forgiveness looks like. But again, blessed are the merciful, for they will receive mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they will receive God. That is, although we will never be sinless, we should sin less the longer we are God's sons and daughters. If we seek to sin less, 
then God will continue in that process of sanctification we've discussed previously, allow us to be more pure. We won't be completely pure until we get to heaven. But if we strive to be sinless, the more we do that, the more we will be able to see, hear, and experience the presence of God, as well as other people will experience the presence of God through us and hear God in our voice and see God in our social media profile, so on and so forth. Blessed are the pure heart, for they will see God. That is how we can discern God is that we understand and accept what God has said about sin and individual sins. And then we strive to actually repent. Repent is not just asking God for forgiveness for a sin. It's turning around, going the other way, doing our best not to uh, participate in sin. And the more we do that, the more we experience God, the more we hear God, and the more we see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they will be called children of God. Those are the people who seek to have peace in the sense of wanting there to be equity and equality. Uh, we have to be careful that we don't equate peace to there never being any disagreement or confrontation. Because sometimes um, it takes confrontation and disagreement to get to actual peace. There is peace uh, that we find in the fruit of the spirit uh, in which is something on the inside that allows us not to respond to everything going on and go to pieces. That is that is there. Uh, but here is these are people who and we know many of them in the civil rights movement, uh, men and women who sh who who were working for there to be peace among everybody, meaning everyone's needs are met. And so then we won't have to clash in the long term because we're allowing everyone with the opportunity to have what is God's in the first place. The earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof. That is, everything is God's anyway, so why are we legislating who does and does not have access to what is God's in the first place? And those who are peacemakers um, are trying to live for that so that their justice and righteousness are experienced. And so we have to be careful that when we say peacemakers is that we're trying to calm stuff down, pretend like there's not um, elements of society and culture that are not of God and don't need to be dealt with. Blessed are the peacemakers, again, are those people who were in the civil rights movement, the women's suffrage movement, uh, those who are in Black Lives Matter, striving for everyone to have uh, what is rightfully everyone's because we're human and God wants to provide for that. And we have some partnership in making sure that we live in such a way, that laws are put in place in such a way, that society is structured in such a way that everyone has access to everything they need. And then we also have to be real about we can't wait on, uh, we should strive and work for that to happen. We also should not wait for the government to do that. And it should start with God's people, that is God's church, for everyone's needs to be met. Um, and then it's two more. Blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. At some point in time, if we are a person of faith, that is going to offend somebody. If we are a person of faith, it's going to create and cause problems. But what Jesus is saying here is just like Jesus experienced that people didn't like him because he was living for God. When it happens, not if, but when it happens that we're living for God and people don't like it, um, the kingdom of heaven is, is already inside of us and we are going to experience it. And this should be comforting for us that are Christians and that we're trying to live in accordance with the Bible and God's will and God's nature. That even when we feel um, that persecution, even when we feel that discomfort, even when people misunderstand us and don't like us and so on and so forth, that God is going to take care of us. Now, we have to give some care and attention to making sure we live in accordance with what Scripture says and not what society has said Christianity is. Because sometimes we get comfortable and we think what we're experiencing is persecution when it's actually consequences for our sin. And we have to really know, again, that's why we're going through this series, to really know what Jesus has said, who Jesus is, so we can live that out. Because there are some uh, policies, there are some human-made laws, even as we saw 
earlier in today's session, um, uh, ideologies that people say are of God and don't have anything to do with God. And so we, we are seeking to learn that, um, particularly in this time and where we're headed to a, a major election in November, it's important to know if we're looking at the platform, is that what the Bible says in context? Again, is that what the Bible says in context? Is that what Jesus said in the first place? Is that what Jesus meant? Uh, because, again, sometimes there's some parts of these political parties' policies, both Republican and Democrat uh, and otherwise, that are not biblical, don't have anything to do with God, but people try to make it. I give an example. There's a phrase, God and country. No, that's not in the Bible. That, that's not what the Bible says. God does not have favorite countries. God does not want us. In fact, that is somewhat idolatry. It should be God and God alone. What has God said? And based upon what God has said in the person of his son, Jesus Christ, and lived, how then should we live our lives? How then should our community be ordered and structured? Not um, because we're America, God loves us the most. Because we're Christian, we should love America. Well, not necessarily. And as we'll see in the prophets on next week, most, if not all, of the prophets were challenging their, their leaders, their political leaders, about how they were not taking care of the people the way God intended for people to be taken care of. So, again, we want to know what Jesus said, what is really in the Bible, what is the intent in context of what's in the Bible, so that we then... When we are held accountable to God, we know that what we're doing is living out the Bible, not based on what somebody else said, but based on what God said in the Bible. And all of us have to do it for ourselves. We do it collectively at times in settings such as this for Bible study and on Sunday. But at the end of the day, uh, we, we not only answer to God as a community, but we answer to God as individuals. And individuals make up the community. And so that is why we're, we're doing this series, so that we can... Uh, better understand it. all of us have have more that we can learn so the beatitudes and here's a summation of of those be i missed one i'm sorry blessed are you when people revile you and persecute you and utter all kinds of evil against you falsely on my account rejoice and be glad for your reward is great in heaven for in the same way they persecuted the prophets who were before you there it is so again there, there are going to be times when we're going to be treated bad simply because we're people of faith and we're living for god Again, we just have to make sure we're living in accordance with Scripture, that we know the Bible for ourselves in context so we can live it out uh, so that we don't confuse persecution uh, with consequences for sin, because that, that can happen. So here's a summation of the Beatitudes uh, and in general the Sermon on the Mount. We learn how to succeed in the kingdom of heaven as opposed to this world. Uh, we learn that what succeeds in the kingdom of heaven also benefits us most in the life here and now. And by us, I mean everybody, not myself personally. But when it does benefit everyone, then it benefits me too. But it should be living in such a way that everyone is benefited and I'm a part of, as opposed to making sure I'm benefited and I don't care about other people because that is not of God. We also receive the fullness of life by investing in others, by taking courageous stands for justice, by ministering to the vulnerable and needy and pursuing God and ourself. Again, we receive the fullness of life by investing in others, by taking courageous stands for justice, by ministering to the vulnerable and needy and pursuing God and ourself. Then we also learn that Jesus never lowered God's ideal. And we see that explicitly in chapter 5, verse 48, where he says, uh, Be perfect, therefore, as your heavenly Father is perfect. Now, let's be real. As humans, none of us are perfect, and we will not be perfect on earth. But what Jesus is saying is that we should be striving to live up to the standards that God has given us. We already talked about mercy, but here is where we're thankful for God's grace. God knew then, God knows now, that we were not going to be able to be perfect, and that's another reason that Jesus died for our sin. I'm so grateful that God sees us through Jesus, because otherwise, you, we already know what, would, what it would be. But I'm so grateful that God sees us through Jesus, and here it is, that second piece. Jesus tenderly offered grace the entire time of his ministry. That's another reason that we should be gracious to people, towards people, 
and merciful towards people because God is that way towards us. And in that, we have to remember God never changed God's standard. And many of us know people that have done their best to live up to God's standard. And we see how this fruit of the spirit comes through their lives. We experience God when we're in their presence. They have wisdom and uh, they even share freely their experiences in life. Yes, maybe to encourage us about what to do, but also so that we don't make some of the mistakes that they made. And if we listen to them, that's another way that God speaks to us. And again, God did not lower his standard. Jesus did not lower God's standard. The standard is still there. What is a blessing, number one, Jesus clarified it in his life, the way he lived, the way he talked and responded to the leaders of his day. And he clarified that God has always intended, and I've tried to communicate as best I could, even with the, with the law in the Hebrew Bible, that the law has always been intended for equity and equality. And Jesus, again, never lowered that standard. He clarified it, and it is there for us to understand. That's why I encourage you to read John, the, God, the rest of the Gospels of the New Testament before we read the Old Testament to give us that clarification. And there's always grace and mercy. So here's our statement of summation, and we will be done. It's a long one, so I'll read it uh, at least twice. Please uh, download the handout if you're watching with us so that you can have this information. Uh, I know I'm talking fast. I know there's a lot of information. Uh, but all of this is on the handout. Jesus of Nazareth was a Jew. Not only was Jesus a Jew, but he was an observant Jew who never disavowed his Jewishness. We see this in his consistent observance of Jewish customs and holy days, in his frequent references to Moses and his acceptance as to, of Torah as holy writ. That's a typo on my part, should be of Torah. All of Jesus' major teachings either were consistent with, the t consistent with the tenets of traditional Judaism or were expansions or elaborations of it, as in Matthew 5, 17 through 48, in which Jesus intensifies the moral ethics of Judaism with the refrain, you have heard said, but I say, and that's where we start. Let me read that again. Jesus of Nazareth was a Jew. Not only was he a Jew, but he was an observant Jew who never disavowed his Jewishness. We see this in his consistent observance of Jewish customs and holy days, in his frequent references to Moses and his acceptance of Torah as holy writ. All of Jesus' major tenet teachings either were consistent with the tenets of traditional Judaism or were expansions or elaborations of it, as in Matthew chapter 5, verses 17 through 48 in which Jesus intensifies the moral ethics of Judaism with the refrain, you have heard said, but I say. And that is from Dr. O'Berry M. Hendricks Jr. from his book, The Politics of Jesus. Okay, I pray that this was helpful and this gives some uh, assistance in us understanding how the New Testament and the Hebrew Bible go together. There is not a juxtaposition there is not a comparison and contrast of old versus new. It is it all goes together. And if we understand it through the lens of the finished work of Jesus Christ, that helps us live out the entirety of the Bible and understand that Jesus did, in fact, come to fulfill the law. On next week, we will also talk about Jesus not only came to fulfill the law, but also the prophets. And how everything that the prophets said and did, who the prophets said and did it towards, um, has significance on how Jesus operated and therefore how we should operate, how we should live, how we should respond to the similarities of the context of the prophets and the context of Jesus' life. Again, I pray that this has been helpful. I hope you've been having a great week. You continue to have a great week. Join us right here on Facebook Live on Sunday at 12 noon as we continue our series uh, from the message of Jesus to the church as we find in Revelations chapter 1 to Revelation chapter 1, 2, and 3. I love you and I will see you on Sunday.